Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the second session titled Is Democracy in Crisis will now begin. Dr. Gilbert Rosman, Editor-in-Chief from the Assen Forum, will be moderating the session. Dr. Rosman, the floor is yours. Well, thank you all for attending. It's uh, important, I think, to talk about democracy in crisis at this time. Uh, it fits in well with uh, the, many of the themes covered here, although we will have to stretch, I think, to talk about Korea's choice because Korea's democracy has been sort of a, a model for uh, interaction and bottom-up ac activities uh, of late. Uh, but let's, let, I want to say something to begin about the, um, the, how we're going to proceed. We're going to have a, um, some opening statements, and some will be a series of thoughts, some will have a, a longer statements. And then we will go to uh, follow-up questions from me, uh, and then go to the audience. But I want to start even before that, uh, after introducing the panelists, by acting as somewhat of a provocateur by saying, yes, democracy is in crisis, and giving some reasons for that, and then people can uh, take that on as they wish. Uh, but let me introduce briefly um, uh, Ladan Buruman is uh, going to be speaking from, she's from Washington, D.C., but speaking uh, with an emphasis on Iran. Uh, Chu Yun Han is from Taiwan, the Academy of Sciences, Academy of Seneca, and uh, he has done a good deal of work on democracy in East Asia, and he also has, a, being a Minnesotan, he has a Minnesota connection, and I think of Minnesota as a state which is sort of a model for democracy in, in the United States. Um, Martin Fackler is well known for his reporting over the years on China, Japan, uh, and he's, uh, he's no longer working for the New York Times, but he has an asset management position in Japan at the moment. Karen House ne needs no introduction. She's been on uh, panels here before and uh, uh, in this session and has, uh, has been introduced for her role in the RAND. Uh, corporation and for her previous role at the Wall Street Journal. And Philip uh, Stevens is, of course, um, with the Financial Times uh, and director of the editorial board. Okay, so my more provocative comments. It seems to me that if we interpret democracy, democracy broadly and we ask of, if, of all the pillars of democracy, are they strengthening or are they weakening? I would argue they're weakening substantially. Also, if you ask in terms of the democratization of Europe or the democratization of Asia, the two regions I think most discussed in terms of the development of democracy, uh, Asia in particular since the 1980s with Korea a prime example, I think we also come to the conclusion there have been some rollbacks, there have been some threats and challenges. Uh, so let me point to, uh, one could spend time defining democracy, uh, but I'll go through um, more why I think democracy is, is suffering uh, setbacks. I think the first one is a kind of political extremism that sees the absence of compromise. So uh, uh, anything goes for your cause to win. Um, uh, I think we see that in, in many countries, including the United States. The second one is a kind of national identity extremism, uh, often driven by religious fundamentalism, uh, sort of uh, in, defining other elements of identity is well more important than democracy in your nation's identity. Democracy becomes a secondary goal when you highlight certain civilizational aspects particularly. Uh, values that are not universal take precedent over values that are universal. A third is much discussed already here, social injustice. Um, <clears throat> a sense that uh, democracy hasn't delivered the fairness that is being expected. A fourth factor that's undermining democracy is sharp power. Uh, with Russia, of course, uh, the prime case of late, but China 
and its exercise of sharp power is a, is a big subject now for, for those investigating it. Technology, changes in technology, surveillance and other things are having an effect, loss of privacy. And finally, the last element I would bring out is the Chinese model as an alternative. If democracy was being challenged by the Soviet socialist model, it's now being challenged by the Chinese model, even if some aspects of that model are not very specific. The idea that China has proven you can have rapid economic development, you can have a strong country, you can build increasing ties to other countries that need you without following a democratic playbook. So in other words, I will raise, those are the factors I'd raise, and I look forward to the comments from our, our participants here. Uh, Adan, please. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you, Asan um, Forum, for inviting me. It's important to include human rights activists in a forum that is, is mainly peopled with policy makers, and I think our worlds are parallel, and sometimes it's really good to have, to, to have some encounters. Um, I, I'm going to talk about Iran and how the Islamic revolution of Iran is one of the challenges uh, that liberal democracy has faced and has mismanaged in a way. Uh, for three decades after the 1979 Islamic Revolution of Iran, liberal democracies misidentified Islamist radicalism and did not consider it as a direct ideological threat, despite the fact that from its inception, it targeted Western democracy as its main enemy and assaulted Muslim citizens for being deviant westernized element. During these fateful decades, Islamism developed and spread its manifold forms around the world. Today, it targets liberal democracy and its values in the heart of Western democracies on the one hand, while on the other hand, fear of Islamism and immigration has prepared the ground for the reemergence of anti-liberal nationalist movements within Western democracies where demagogues have become serious electoral contenders and even winners. Recalling the Beslan school massacre of 2004, we note that even in Russia, the resurgence of authoritarianism was first nourished and justified by the fear of Islamism. It was first in Iran that Islamism proved itself to be a viable political project and a historical success story. It is the Islamic Republic of Iran, moreover, that launched the project of exporting Islamist ideology. Iran's conferences, training, and financing have been behind a myriad of Shia and Sunni Islamist groups around the world. It's Iran whose unwavering support for the Syrian government and meddling in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen have resulted in the current disastrous situation in the broader Middle East. The failure of Islamist ideology in Iran will no doubt damage all Islamist movement around the world and will deprive liberal democracies, illiberal demagogues, of some of their key fear-mongering propaganda tools. What exactly has Iran been exporting? Let us take a look at the intellectual roots of this ideology. Ayatollah Khomeini, the Islamic Republic's founder, conceived his theopolitical project as an effort to cure the corruption of westernized Muslim society and to establish the government of God on earth. God, claimed Khomeini, had designated him as voice of the divine on earth. The cornerstone of his theopolitical project was the velayat faqih which means the guardianship of the Islamic jurisprudent. Velayat faqih assigns the status of minor to citizens and denies people sovereignty. In its original form, this clerical prerogative was limited to mentally handicapped citizens and orphans and had little in common with the political system promoted by the revolutionary Ayatollah. Khomeini's genius consisted in taking this controversial juridical prerogative and amalgamating it with a modern revolutionary tradition inspired by Leninism. 
the amalgam resulted in a new and somehow modern totalitarian political religious ideology. The first thing Khomeini did after he took the control of Iran was to set up a system of revolutionary tribunals with no investigation, no lawyers, no appeals, and no due process. This instrument of intimidation, which is still terrorizing Iranians to this day, was not inspired by any Islamic canon law and had no precedent in the Prophet's tradition. It was, in fact, directly inspired by modern revolutionary tradition that the Ayatollah had incorporated into his syncretic ideology. The majority of Grand Ayatollahs who disapproved of political and revolutionary Islam were either silenced, placed under house arrest, or defrocked, as was Grand Ayatollah Shariat Madari for the crime of promoting an American Islam. The dichotomy between American Islam and revolutionary Islam has been a recurrent theme in Iranian official discourse in the last 40 years. Ayatollah Khomeini's January 7, 1989 letter to Mikhail Gorbachev provides enlightening clues concerning this dichotomy. The Soviet Union real problems, Khomeini reminded Gorbachev, does not concern private property, economics, and liberty. I seriously ask you to avoid being trapped in the Western and great Satan's prison. Ironically, Ayatollah Khomeini had never felt compelled to write to the Soviet leadership while they were waging war against God in Afghanistan, but he did endanger he did feel endangered by the example of the USSR liberalizing itself. In his letter, the West and the great Satan are neither countries nor specific policies. They refer instead to a worldview, namely the liberal democratic worldview, the one that defines man as an autonomous, free-willed being. In fact, Iran's revolutionary Islam is more consistent with modern revolutionary totalitarianism than with Islam. That is why, from its inception, this peculiar theocratic body politic has been more inclined to ally itself with the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China and North Korea, rather than th with the United States, the most God-friendly of the Western liberal democracies. Waging war against the autonomous man of liberal democracy and creating a new homo Islamicus in a purified society were and still are the two main objectives of the revolutionary Islamist project. Forty years after its surge on the history stage, revolutionary Islam can rightfully boast its successes in its crusade against the liberal democratic West and the extension of its influence to Israeli borders. But, and this but matters for liberal democracy, as it recognizes its worldwide successes, the Iranian regime also admits its failure in creating the homo Islamicus at home, for its own citizens are defying it on a massive scale. Ironically, it is the post-revolutionary generation that is refusing to become the homo Islamicus the regime wants them to be. In 2000, an official survey found that 75% of all Iranians and 86% of students did not say their prayers. By 2009, 50% of the country's mosques were inactive. From the mid-1980s, a small group of disillusioned revolutionary clerics and intellectuals started to lay the groundwork for a radical religious reformation. Despite their differences, these reformers agree that the realm of politics and religions are separate, that God has created an autonomous and free-willed man, made him his lieutenant on earth, and endowed him with natural reason to take care of his own worldly affairs. We are now witnessing the development of a secularist, liberal, democratic theology in Shia Islam. Though in exile and dismissed by the regime as promoters of American Islam, these reformists find attentive ears within traditional religious seminaries, and promoted by popular preachers inside the country, their ideas appeal to millions of the faithful. 
In December 2017, the Iranian regime faced insurrection in more than 80 cities. People were protesting corruption, high living costs, and the lack of job. Since then, there has not been a day in Iran without sporadic demonstrations. Time and again, demonstrators have pointed to political Islam as the main cause of their calamities and openly demanded a secular regime. Furthermore, considerable segments of society are simply leaving Islam. Security forces regularly target Baha'is, Christian house churches, and Muslim mystics of different schools, trying to contain mass conversion to belief system that call for peace, love, and the separation of religion from political authority. Women have taken off their mandatory veils in order to claim their freedom of choice. <coughs> Lawyers and human rights defenders, joined by some veterans of the Islamic Revolution, have been calling for a transition to secular democracy. These are significant developments. Their recurrence, despite state violence, points to the profound change that is underway in the social and cultural fabric of this Muslim country. The violent dialectical interaction between the regime and civil society has revealed the hollowness of the concept of homo islamicus, whose essence is negatively defined by what it isn't, namely the autonomous man. It would be an ironic twist of fate to see that as it's successfully destabilizing liberal democracies in their birthplaces, Islamist ideology is unwillingly fostering the cultural rooting of liberal democratic founding concepts in its own heartland. So I'm ending uh, about Korea's choice between a regime that is directly targeting liberal democratic worldview and a society that is fighting for <coughs> making autonomous man its own cultural heritage, where would Korea stand? And, and another question that I wanted to pose, why is it that the West misidentified the Islamist tra threat? And I think in this question, maybe if we have the chance to discuss it, we will see the Achilles heel of liberal democratic culture in the West. So. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I, I came away with uh, at least two takeaways, and many of you may have come up with others. Uh, the first is, here's a regime that supposedly stands for the Islamic cause, and yet it supports governments that don't that repress that cause, such as the movements in Xinjiang that are being so strongly repressed by the Chinese. I assume Iran is not saying much about that. Nothing. Uh, and the other is that, yes, democracy has new vitality. It is not so much in crisis when you see these bottom-up forces in Iran. Um, Professor Chu. Uh, yes. Uh, well, certainly it's a privilege uh, to be part of this panel. Uh, I would like to share my, uh, my own observation of the state of democracy uh, around the world today. Uh, I have to say that there isn't much good news about democracy nowadays. On the country, there are many, many bad news, uh, or a lot of bad, bad news about democracy. We knew that just a few days ago, a comedian uh, was elected president in Ukraine uh, with a landslide victory. Um, and the newly elected president in Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro, uh, uh, actual, you know, far-right uh, politician. Uh, last month, he just ordered the army uh, to celebrate the 55th anniversary of the 1964 military coup. Um, and you know, and this is uh, you know what we have just observed. My, my dear friend, uh, uh, one of my closest collaborator, I, I, I believe he's also a very close colleague of uh, Chai Bong. Larry Diamond, he wrote uh, an article uh, as early as 2007, published in uh, Foreign Affairs, in which he issued a warning that the world is now entering a global democratic recession. Uh, that article was widely cited, but also generated a lot of debate. Around that time, 
uh, other scholar um, disputed you know, his observation, uh, thinking that he might overstate okay, uh, this worse and trend. But in retrospect, I have to say that Larry turned out to be exactly right. Uh, exactly right. If you look at the balance sheet uh, based on Frieden House score, meaning that you know, how many countries who have been upgraded from uh, uh, not free to partially free, from partially free to free, uh, minus you know, uh, countries that have been downgraded from free to partially free to not free, I'm, uh, you know, we are running a deficit over the last 15 years. Uh, I'm steering uh, 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 the, uh, the Executive Council of Global Brahms Survey. Uh, this very large global survey network uh, comprised of uh, five uh, large-scale comparative survey covered cover different regions in the world. We have a Latino barometer, uh, Asian barometer, uh, and Arab barometer. Uh, unfortunately, we, we couldn't cover Iran for obvious reason. Uh, and, and, and also, uh, we have Afrobarometer, and then we have Eurasia Barometer. Altogether, we cover 93 countries around the world, mostly uh, emerging democracy or society in transition. Um, the trend line, uh, you know, looks very alarming. Uh, si to put it simply, democracy, especially young democracy, uh, have not produced many more Democrats. On the contrary, uh, more and more uh, citizens, they become disenchanted with the way democracy uh, you know, work in their country. Uh, that includes even the younger generation, uh, even the millennial. Uh, in their eyes, that you know, democracy uh, just uh, didn't deliver uh, socioeconomically and doesn't really uh, guarantee rule of law uh, due process. And a lot of countries, they are stuck, you know, in uh, passing gridlock, uh, recurring scandal, corruption, and abuses of power, uh, and erosion of rule of law, uh, which has happened uh, across the board. And if you look at another uh, interesting article, which was published uh, uh, in 2017, which also generated a lot of debate uh, in the community, uh, of political science. That is an article joint authored by Professor Monk of Harvard and Professor Foy of uh, uh, Monash, in which they, uh, they provide hard evidence suggesting that the crisis of democracy, that the erosion of the legitimacy of the democratic system has proliferated from, not just from the survey democracy, but into the, uh, the established democracy, the established liberal democracy. And they also discovered that in countries like the United States, in countries like Australia, it is among the younger generation, you know, people under 35, uh, they are less committed, uh, much less committed to democratic norm and values uh, as compared to their parent or the baby boomer uh, generation. So this is really something, you know, uh, we have to, uh, to be very serious. Well, why is that? Okay, obviously, you know, you know why? Uh, you know, we are eyewitnessing what has happened. Uh, I, I think Professor Gilman already identified some potential sources, you know, for this erosion. Uh, basically, I, I will uh, list four, you know, forces or factors. Um, um, and the, the, the four, uh, they are not, uh, you know, uh, uh, interchangeable, but they are highly correlated. Number one, I would say, is a new liberal revolution that was introduced more than 35 years ago, okay? Uh, that, you might call it reform, you might call it revolution. Uh, basically, uh, it substantially reduced the capacity of any democratic, democratic elected government to do much in the social realm and in the economic realm. Okay, the government becomes constrained. They don't have enough resources, they don't have enough policy instruments to deal with, to address the pent up demand uh, from the mass, you know, from the economic, social economic, underprivileged uh, group. And also that reform has tipped the balance substantially in favor of uh, the, the, the wealthy uh, people and also the corporate elite. 
uh, at expense of labor and middle class. Okay? Uh, and also that reform has spread out through the world under the auspice of Washington Consensus to create a planet become flat, which means that removal of all the man-made barrier for the movement of capital, information, and commodity and merchandise, which again is extremely in favor uh, of those people who have the, either the capital or the skill that can be easily transportable across the border, but at very disadvantage of, again, the labor, the working class, and, and also the middle class. Number two, related to this, is the technological revolution. Uh, that have you know taken place over the last 30 years, automation uh, and, and digital uh, uh, technology that enables the corporation to to trim down, to eliminate so many uh, intermediate level of management. Okay, and through merger and acquisition, that e even further eliminate uh, uh, the middle uh, uh, ranking uh, managerial and and junior. Uh, 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 position, and, and also workers are uh, replaced either by, you know, through the outsourcing of some of the manufacturing activity offshore, or they are simply replaced by robot, you know, by machine, uh, by software, okay? Um, so we, we are eyewitnessing, you know, erosion of the social foundation for liberal democracy to flourish. That is, you have to have a middle class, you know, that have to constitute the backbone of the society, but no, n we, we don't see that. You know, we see the, you know, the middle class workers, they are sandwiched. Uh, we, we are, I wouldn't think more and more people become what we call the pre-terrier. Uh, that's a new social class. People without steady just the income. They live in a constant state without security, without predictability, okay? Um, and, you know, some people might, you know, find it very fancy. I'm a freelance, you know, professional. Uh, but I tell you, 80% or 90% of so-called freelance, okay, they live uh, uh, in the undercut condition, you know, which is much uh, uh, less desirable than the traditional full-time employment. And, and, and third factor, uh, I would argue, you know, what uh, Ronnie, uh, uh, Danny Roderick of Harvard also identified as there's a process of hyper-globalization. Okay, obviously the new liberal reform accelerate this hyper-globalization. The digital te technology revolution also accelerate the hyper-globalization. And the hyper-globalization, again, uh, create, you know, in every society, a very lopsided distribution of income and wealth, okay? So increasingly in the eye of, especially the younger generation, you know, across Europe, uh, uh, and also I would say in the United States, that, you know, people look at, you know, the uh, representative democracy, you know, in a very cynical way. Uh, they, they agree, with, you know, they probably will sign up to uh, what uh, Joseph Stiglitz, you know, has, has you know, said about uh, the, the, the democracy is no longer of the people, by the people, and for the people, it's of the 1%, for the 1%, by the 1%. Um, uh, and hyperglobalization also means that, you know, the economic sovereignty has been transferred from national capital to elsewhere, to powerful transnational actors uh, like Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple company, software, they are not even accountable, you know, to any constituency in any meaningful way, or to Brussels, or to IMF, or to uh, the F uh, Federal Reserve, uh, Reserve Board uh, on, on global uh, scale. Um, and remember that democracy, uh, when it was invented uh, or uh, had been introduced uh, over the last you know, more than 100 years, is designed for a nation state, okay? It, you know, it really, uh, come with the national sovereignty. But if your s economic sovereignty has been transferred elsewhere, uh, there's not much an elected government can do much to address uh, the, the, the concern, the complaint, the demand of the mass. Uh, if you don't really find a way to resolve this dilemma, and I have, I have to be when, when honest, very honest with you, you know, movement, those disrupt, disruptive movements like the yellow vest will 
erupt everywhere. Will erupt everywhere until the point, you know, that the current system become more responsive. Okay, uh, really substantially more held, you know, accountable. Uh, to the great majority of society. And the last factor I want to point out, uh, very unfortunately, is the introduce of the social media. Uh, and that creates uh, self-imposed social segregation, uh, aggravate the fragmentation within society, uh, and we have the so-called <coughs> digital tribalism uh, in every society. Uh, not only, you know, no longer we have the so-called mainstream uh, mass media who, uh, who serve the, the function of gatekeeping. Uh, in the past, you know, they really helped to preserve the so-called centrist position, the middle ground, foster social consensus among elite, but also among uh, the, the general public. Not anymore, not anymore. Society, different segments of society become less tolerant toward each other. Not only lo no longer share the same identity, norms or values, now that they don't even share the same facts. So we enter into the so-called post-truth right? uh, era, uh, very unfortunately. Uh, people simply you know, uh, uh, communicate with uh, people with like-minded, uh, reinforce their prejudice, uh, and, and that, that also allow the populace you know, uh, being able to reach out to those isolated you know, people in social silo and manipulate their fear and manipulate their hatred. Okay, and prejudice. Um, and this is a world that we are facing today. Uh, I will come back to you know, how we might do to correct, to rectify this later on, but, but this is, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't have much good news for you, okay? Uh, but this is my diagnosis, thank you. Yeah. I think what we just heard was a strong case for democracies in crisis, with a lot of factors mentioned and worrying tendencies, and yet we came across the anomaly of outsiders such as in Ukraine through the public electoral process coming to power, suggesting there is some element of democracy that uh, is, is sustained uh, and if presumably has the potential to carry on, although that, that one could raise <laughs> doubts about the prospects of that continuity. Uh, Martin? Well, um, can we go home now? I mean, I think Professor Ju answered all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I first I just want to say thank you to the folks at ASAN. You guys always throw a great conference, and uh, I, I, I imagine the people at ASAN sitting around for 12 months trying to think of what big questions to throw at us, and is democracy in crisis certainly is a, is a big one. Um, but they're always very important questions. Um, you know, Dr. Ju showed us the view from 30,000 feet. Um, I think I'm going to very briefly show a view much closer to the ground um, and reflecting kind of where I come from. Um, I'm from Georgia, in the, in the, that's Confederate Georgia, not Soviet. Um, and the people around me all voted for Trump. And, you know, I'm, why did you vote for Trump? And the answer I get is, he's Tony Soprano. I don't care if he's flawed and immoral or amoral or whatever, he gets the job done. And they feel like they, they identify with him and can connect with him at a very basic level. Um, and save that thought for a second. I've spent most of the last 20 years in Japan. The last time I actually lived in the US for an extended period of time was during the Clinton administration. Um, and in Japan, I see a very different view of what's going on in the world. But actually, in a lot of ways, which resonates a lot with what I see when I go home to, to Rabin County, Georgia. And I think one thing I would say is we got to be careful when we talk about democracy and crisis. I think we're talking about a very specific moment in history. We're talking about the post-war US-led liberal order in crisis. I mean, you could argue, for example, the ability of the United States to elect a complete outsider and disruptor is actually, in some ways, a testimony to, to democracy. In Japan, that would never happen. The political caste controls the system. Abe is a third generation politician, and that's just starting in 1945. And I guarantee you his family didn't appear out of thin air. 
Um, the people who were the daimyo in the Edo period are still around today, and they're powerful. And, and so the ability, you know, at some very basic level, to, to elect a disruptor and an outsider is actually perhaps a testimony to democracy in some way. So we're talking about a very specific, I think, type of democracy. We're talking about the liberal order, the post-war liberal order, and the values around it, and in a sense, the solution that came out of the horror of World War II. And how do we prevent that from happening again, right? And I do think that that system is in crisis. I wish I could be contrarian to everybody else here, but I don't think I can be. Um, and what do I see kind of connecting Georgia and Tokyo? Um, and I think what I see in both places is a sense that this post-war order uh, is has lost direction, it's lost leadership, um, it's not meeting people's needs, and you're, as a result, you have this deep sense of disempowerment. Steve Bannon likes to come to Japan, and he likes to come to Japan because I think he finds, he, he identifies things going on there which are very familiar to the uh, currents that he taps in the United States. In a lot of ways, Japan was a precursor of what happened in the U.S. in 2016. Uh, you had 10 years ago, and, and I'm not going to get into the debate of which was first, but, but you did have in Japan 10 years ago the emergence of what's called the net right, like internet net, net right, which was a, um, an angry nationalist uh, populism, if you will, based on the internet, hence the name. Um, and I think when, when, for example, Steve Bannon comes to Japan, he, you know, he, th there are a lot of the same motivations are the same that drive that discontent in Japan that I think drove the discontent in the U.S. Um, I think there's a sense that, uh, uh, as people have mentioned, that the system is no longer delivering the goods, that the inequalities have gotten so bad. Um, that's happened in Japan as well as in the U.S. It's more extreme in the U.S., but in Japan there's a problem with uh, single mothers and poverty, and a lot of these inequalities are appearing there as well. But more fundamental, I think, is a sense of disempowerment in the people for whom the system should be working. Or this is, this is the, the, there's, there's a large group in Japan who feel like the system should belong to them, and it doesn't. It's not working for their, their good anymore. And these tend to be Japanese men, middle-aged men, um, or younger. And uh, I've met many of them. I wrote some stories about this back when I was a journalist. Uh, and they would often be men in their 30s and 40s who were working part-time jobs or contract jobs and just kind of felt like somehow the society should be serving them, and it's not. And it's interesting that they would express that um, the biggest group of this sort of net right was a group that was against the special privileges that foreigners have in Japan. Um, and they're really speaking about Koreans uh, in Japan. And, but the idea is that the system had somehow been rigged to help these Koreans get ahead of them. And they were up in arms against that. And that's not very dissimilar to what I experienced when I go back to, to, to Rabin County, to Georgia. Uh, there's a sense there that uh, the, the government, the federal government, is helping other people get in line ahead of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the working class, w white uh, families, um, and that it's, it's not fair, right? And I think that same sort of sense, it's not fair, is in Japan as well. Um, and what's interesting is that it, it gets expressed online. You know, social media has lowered the threshold for publishing, if you will. Back, you know, 20 years ago, you had to have a publication. It was hard to get your ideas out there. You know, wrote a letter to the editor. Now you can just open a Facebook account, right? And you can publish to your heart's content. Um, but if you go online, you see a lot of these sort of, uh, this, this, the anger often gets expressed as, um, we talked about fake news and kind of the, the wobbliness of truth these days. So kind of a, almost like a politicization of truth but you also see uh, conspiracy theories and this idea that the, 
that the, the ruling class or the, the establishment is trying to pull the wool over our eyes. It's giving us a false history. It's not telling us the true history. In Japan, this tends to overlap with older uh, revisionist strains. So you get kind of a victor's justice that you know Japan was actually the good guy in World War II. And, um, uh, which is interesting to have Steve Bannon and, and some of these folks in the U.S. aligning with people who thought that uh, Pearl Harbor was the right move. But, um, but, but, but the shared commonality there, though, is I think a sense that, uh, that the true history has somehow been covered up and we've been fooled by this post-war order, and it's time to lift the veil and kind of figure out what our real interests are. Um, I do think the one common thing that, that, that uh, folks like Steve Bannon and the Japanese, sort of this new right, net right, share is a sense that China is the shared enemy. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, uh, when, when Bannon comes to Tokyo, he's very pro-Japanese and very pro-Abe, and, and, but, but often from the perspective of we have shared challenges, right? And, and China is kind of the shared challenge. Um, so I think that but that sense of disempowerment and the rise of China touches on another vein, which is a sense of foreboding. I, I get the sense both in rural Georgia and in urban Japan that there's a feeling that the current system, that we face enormous problems and the current system is not answering those problems. And whether that's climate change, you know, whatever it is, there's a whole host of them. And if you, depending on who you ask, the list is different. But we face these enormous problems, <coughs> inequalities in the society, um, you know, the rise of China, et cetera, um, that the current system is not, is not answering those questions. And, and that these questions can be existential, that these aren't minor questions, that there's a real sort of sense of that history is going in a bad direction. And unless we act, unless we do something, that, that it's not a utopian sort of progress that we're looking towards, but something, uh, it's going to get worse. Um, it's almost like a, like a fundamental pessimism somewhere um, at the root of this. Um, and then the loss of direction. I think in Japan, that's easily seen as the loss of leadership by the United States. Um, and you see kind of the result of that is very interesting. Uh, you see. Japan's absolute dependence on the U.S., uh, I think, comes into full view. You see Abe Shinzo has become kind of the consummate Trump handler, you know, rushing over to the gold tower right after the election, and then they had that golf, golfing outing in Japan where they had the hats. Uh, you know, Abe made the hat about, you know, Abe and Don, friends forever, whatever it said. Um, and so you have, I think, that the reaction that you're seeing in Japan is a sense uh, the physical manifestation of the sense that, that, that there's a loss of direction, a loss of leadership. We're not going in a good direction. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is watching through a Japanese lens uh, the, this new reality in Washington where there are no more consequences, where you can kind of catch the president lying and it doesn't matter, right? Um, or, or whatever it is, that somehow not only has truth become relative, but morality has become relative. And when you see that kind of through the lens of the Japanese media, it, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because it's, it really sort of, it becomes sort of a, a, a loss of, you know, the world is going this way. And, uh, you know, maybe five or ten years ago, you could, it, people, people, there were certain values that you didn't challenge that were seen as being, uh, you know, kind of the, the values that guided uh, the current order, and suddenly those values are uh, seem to 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 to, to be lo a, a lot less important, and nothing has really kind of come to take their place. Um, and in the case of um, you know th looking at Japan, I think what what you know the the reaction so far has been to kind of try to, to try to bind itself more closely to the U.S. and to kind of encourage the Americans and hey you guys got to stay in the game stay in Asia we need you out here, um, but there is also this growing uh, concern in Japan that the U.S. could turn on a dime, and uh, you know Trump could send out a tweet tomorrow that we're going to pull out of Okinawa. I mean who knows? We just it's a world where suddenly all of the sort of certitudes are a lot more liquid than they used to be. Um, 
And you're seeing Japan, uh, as a result, taking moves such as, if you've been watching this sort of slow enhancement of the capabilities of the self-defense forces. Uh, Japan is basically, slowly, and in its own sort of way, preparing for the day when the U.S. isn't there. Um, you know, we now learn that the Kaga and the, um, the Izumo, the two new destroyers, which are really aircraft carriers, will be taking F-35, uh, is it the B, the vertical takeoff variant. Um, and so it's, it's, it's uh, I, you know, I, what I see in Japan is kind of the sense of loss of direction and kind of where is the world going. If the U.S. isn't leading, who is? Japan really, you know, there was talk for a while in Japan if Japan could kind of step up and lead, and that hasn't really happened. Um, and, and if I switch back to Georgia for my final thought, uh, you know, the feeling there, I think, uh, is, is different, but it's, it's, um, there it's almost more like these older strands of American history, if you will, like uh, kind of pre-war. Like America First is a pre-war idea, right? It's in the 1930s there was America First, right? First, right? Charles Lindbergh was America First in kind of America not getting involved in these destructive European wars like World War I. Um, and so some of these older strains seem to be coming back to the surface in, in, in a different form. Um, and, uh, you know, you know it's, uh, it, it does seem to be a refutation of the, the post-war consensus, if you will. Um, and where it goes next in the U.S., I don't know. Um, but I do think that the economic factors that we've talked about are very important. And final note, maybe uh, the, the far right has been much less disruptive in Japan than the U.S. They haven't won an election. I don't think Abe really is a far right candidate. Um, and I think it's because of the economics. Japan's done a better job, I think, of blunting the disruption. You know, Uber doesn't operate in Japan, for example. Airbnb has been severely restricted. Um, but I, th I do think that, you know, that maybe Japan's a test case that the economic inequalities and kind of these economic disruptions are perhaps a driver of some of these changes. So just a few random thoughts. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martin. Uh, there's a lot there to think <laughs> about, but, but the, the, there are two basic points I come away with. One is you are reaffirming the sense there's a crisis in democracy. On the other hand, though, Abe represents continuity. He keeps getting reelected. There's no political opposition that is galvanizing against him. There's no turn to an outsider. It seems so different from what you're seeing in Georgia. Somehow this thing need to be reconciled. I won't ask you to do that right now, but I hope later we can get right, into that right. question. Does Japan really represent another case of a crisis in democracy? Many would say it hasn't been of that sort. Right. Karen? Uh, <clears throat> I want to start off by using the word perspective. Uh, I am probably not in harmony with uh, most of the hand-wringing uh, thus far. I think if you just think back to 30, 35 years ago, most of the world was living under totalitarian regimes, the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, much of Africa, um, and a lot of Asia. And in what is really a very short period of time, we're now agonizing over the state of democracy. Um, if, if Yes, um, Russia is moving in the wrong direction. Turkey's moving in the wrong direction. China is uh, more authoritarian uh, even than before. Um, but the free market uh, aspect of the world continues to function. And I am one of those that believes in the long arc of history that free markets and free people do go together. Um, and therefore, um, as uh, Mr. Chung wrote in his uh, autobiography, the only system uh, free markets are the only system that uh, provides for, uh, that can improve the lives of individual citizens. And I think that is still true. So my concern these days is less about the future of democracy than the future of free markets. Uh, in the U.S., 
uh, you have the democratic administer uh, democratic politicians, um, you know, pushing all kinds of socialistic um, scenarios for the the U.S. Uh, going forward. I think I, the other word I would like to use is the one that Yuli already used, but rebalancing. I think we have to bear in mind that life is cyclical, or that things are at some level constantly rebalancing, so that I would uh, underscore what uh, someone here actually already said, that the fact that people are kind of standing up and saying the system's not fair, the system needs changing, is evidence that democracy is working. Um, but as somebody used the uh, Ukrainian example, our Donald Trump's election. Uh, Trump, in many ways, was a reaction, I think, to President Obama, who told the world and Americans, America's not good enough to lead, we're really morally no good, you know, we should uh, step back and um, uh, and mind our own business. And Trump, uh, Trump, in a sense, took that up and uh, and echoed it and said, no, we're good enough to lead, but we expect everybody else to cooperate and help pay the bills. Um, so the, the cyclicality or rebalancing, I think, I'm old enough to remember when people in the U.S. thought democracy was in crisis in the 60s and 70s with the Vietnam War and the weathermen blowing up buildings and the SDS burning uh, university presidents' homes, et cetera. And, you know, basically Ronald Reagan came along in the 80s and got um, elected on Morning in America and people um, began to be optimistic again. And I think people are pessimistic now. They do think things are moving in the wrong direction. But for me, the fact that people stand up and say, I don't like the direction they're moving is a sign that, uh, that democracy still functions. So I think one should definitely see the glass as at least half full. And, uh, and not half empty. And one last comment on the Chinese model. Uh, I think that the Chinese model may ju be just about to run its course. Um, I'm also old enough to remember the Japanese model and Japanese, uh, Japan being number one in the um, late 80s. Um, and uh, I happen to have spent a year at the Wall Street Journal going around the world talking to people about is this true, and if so, why, and if not, why not? And basically um, wrote what a lot of people cynically recalled my, uh, called my Up With America series in the Wall Street Journal, but basically a series that said actually the J Japanese aren't 10 feet tall. And I think the the Chinese economy has a lot of the same uh, difficulties now um, that are going to um, make that look less like a model over the next 20 years than it has over the last 20 years. And on that, I'll stop. Well, thank you so much for your comments. I think that kind of uh, diversion, uh, difference of views on a panel is just what we're looking for. So we get a contrast of thinking, and so I'm really pleased that we've, we've had that exchange. Uh, Philip? Um, yeah, I think I'd like to, uh, Karen's stolen one of my points, but, uh, or preempted one of them. I'd, I'd like to make three points. One, is democracy in crisis? Answer, no. Um, two, are there some challenges and threats to democracy? Yes. Uh, we see that in the rise, as someone said, of populist parties of the right and left in Europe. Uh, and in and elsewhere in the sort of illiberal capital, illiberal democracy that we see in Turkey. But it's, there, these are threats and challenges. This is not a crisis. Uh, three, where do these 
wh where are the roots for these threats and challenges coming from? And I'd say we are facing a crisis, and it's a crisis of liberal capitalism, unfettered liberal capitalism. Mm -hmm. So first point, crisis of democracy. Precisely Karen's point here, let's have some perspective. Go back to 1980, look at the world, how many democracies were there then in this part of the world, in Africa, in Latin America, in Europe? We've had an enormous advance in democracy over a 30, 25, 30, 40 year period. The fact that we've had some setbacks in recent years uh, in the Arab world uh, uh, five or six years ago and in some of the Eastern European states and places like Turkey is regrettable, but that is not a crisis. And we do not see, or I don't see, people on the streets saying, we want the Russian model. <laughs> we want the Chinese model. We want less freedom of speech. We want to get rid of the rule of law. Well, if there are people demonstrating for those things, um, I haven't seen them. Second point, the threats and challenges and the rise of populism. I mean, as someone said earlier, I think the, uh, the beginning of wisdom in understanding populism is that the populists have a point. Uh, we may not like them, we may think they're vulgar, uncouth, uh, a lot of them are xenophobic, sometimes racist. Uh, they're selling snake oil most of the time, um, but they have tapped into real grievances. And if you want to go, if you want a starting point, you go back to the global financial crash, which crystallized a distortion uh, in our liberal market system which meant that, the, which showed us how the gains from globalization had been so unequally shared. So in my own country, median wages have effectively stagnated for 15 or 20 years or so. Uh, job security has diminished greatly, so people are no longer certain whether they have a job for a month, a year, or even sometimes whether they've got a job tomorrow. They're on zero hours contracts. And most critically, people are no longer confident uh, that their children will be better off mm. than they are. This sense of the system being unfair uh, breaks, if you like, in, in Europe, the social contract in which the market economy and a reasonably fair society in which opportunities were well distributed, not equally, but well distributed, reinforced each other. We've taken out, if you like, the, uh, the, the social market economy, and I would argue in the US what's happened is the American dream mm -hmm. has been taken out of the system uh, by these inequalities, which has undermined um, uh, faith. But I don't think it's undermined faith in democracy what it's done is undermine faith in the established political elites, in the concentration of power in big parties of, of center right, center left, many of whom now don't offer a choice. They cease to offer a choice between, you know, you look at Tony Blair's government in the UK versus David Cameron's government in the UK. For most people, that's not much of a choice. So I think the, the backlash is against, if you like, the political establishment rather than against mm -hmm. the concept of democracy. I think that's very important to hold. Now, the danger with populists is that they try to chip away at the institutions of democracy, like the judicial system, like the rule of law, like freedom of speech, and that's why you have to push back. How do we solve this? I mean, I think the problem in with our market, I'm a believer in the free market system. I think the problem is not the socialists. I think the problem is the concentration of power in, in our capitalism, the absence of sufficient competition, I think in the US, but also in Europe. One of the biggest problems now is the absence of com competitive markets. Mm -hmm. um, and 
which mirrors, if you like, the absence of competitive politics, as it were. So I think we have to deal with uh, the flaws and the, and the faults in our system. And I was struck earlier this week when a guy called Ray Dalio, who runs Bridgewater, and I think he's one of uh, uh, America's richest uh, capitalists, uh, he said, I think there's a crisis of capitalism. Uh, it's not, you know, so if people like him or there's the, uh, the heir to the Disney fortune who said uh, uh, not only, uh, not even Jesus Christ is worth 500 times the median average income or the median <laughs> income of his workers. So I think these are the issues that we should be really focusing. If we make if you like, the market system fair again, I think many of the problems of our democracies will deal with themselves. And I think government has, I don't subscribe to this view that globalization has robbed governments of all their power and they can't do anything. Mm -hmm. I think governments can do things. If you look at tax policy in the OECD countries over the last 25 years, it's actually reinforced the trends of technology, and uh, globalization by giving more money uh, to those at the very top. If you look at social welfare policy, it tends to have entrenched, helped people with no jobs, but done very little mm -hmm. to actually help people to get into jobs. If you look at the failures of our ed education systems. So I think there's an, an enormous amount that national governments can do. One, to, if you like, fix the liberal uh, economic market economy, and two, in the process, fix, or, uh, fix our democracy, which needs fixing but is not in crisis. Okay, another view about democracy not being in crisis, although we heard of a lot of challenges, uh, and so one might say, what is the definition of crisis? Uh, does it, is it a breakdown of institutions? Is it the disempowerment down below where people feel they don't control the system anymore? So the views, the perspectives really came from different angles here. Uh, and I think that was a healthy kind of exchange with the conclusions depending heavily on definitions of crisis and even of democracy. But so just let's come back. You face challenges, you and I face challenges in our lives, our daily lives all the time. Sometimes big challenges, sometimes small challenges. We know the difference between a challenge and a crisis. I don't think there's any blurring. I mean, there are things that need fixing. When you're in crisis, things are out of control. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to respond? Yeah, I just one uh, issue. I would have agreed with you uh, had I not uh, seen that the constitutional reform in uh, Hungary had they have taken out the very concept of human rights from their constitution. And this, for me, is a sign of uh, ideological crisis. Because what characterized uh, the post-World War, uh, uh, World War II <coughs> was that all European countries um, limited in their constitution their sovereignty by the human rights, which meant that in their constitutional text, they admitted a universal definition of human being and its values, liberties, and dignity. And they limited their sovereignty in the name of these universal values. What worries me right now, um, you know, I would have adhered to your ideas about serious challenges, and I would even qualify it as a challenge of growth of democracy. But with this setback in the Hungary's constitutions and the tendencies in the Eastern European countries to limit freedom of the press, freedom of choices, I would be a little bit more worried uh, about the direction taken. Otherwise, I would, I would agree with you that when I was young in, in the 1970s, most of the youth were communists in France, in Italy, in Spain. So we have had these challenges for liberal democracy before. So what Munch um, wrote in his article, actually, is 
worrying, but it's not exceptional in the history of uh, democracy. But the fact that we are stepping, we are going back of what we had achieved after World War II, this is, for me, an alarming signal. Chu Yunhan? Uh, well, actually, I think political scientists have uh, a pretty good, clear idea, you know, what constitutes a crisis of, de of democracy. Uh, uh, just give you just one example that uh, uh, our two colleagues, uh, I mean, colleagues of uh, democracy uh, scholar, uh, Stephen uh, Levitsky and Daniel uh, Ziblatt, both of them uh, teach at Harvard. Um, they published a book just recently, uh, How Democracy Die. <laughs> um, and they identify, uh, you, know, uh, you know, those uh, evidence of, uh, of uh, what they call the, the crisis of deconsolidation. Not, not outright breakdown, but, but, you know, but it's cumulative. You know, if those deconsolidation process take hold, uh, then, you know, democracy might vulnerable to uh, non-democratic alternative. Uh, number one is the, uh, the uh, erosion of popular support for democratic system. Erosion of what? Erosion of pop popular support for democracy. And they are, if a large segment of population, they are more perceptive to non-democratic alternative. You know, a strong man rules, he can get rid of, you know, court, he can get rid of parliament, or he can suppress, okay, freedom of speech, uh, you know, freedom of, uh, of demonstration, and also uh, to, uh, to, to repress uh, the, op the opposition, you know, with all the, the power at its disposal. Uh, so that, that, that would be a clear sign uh, of, you know, democracy is in danger of being deconsolidated. Another would be that, you know, there are tangible political forces and tangible political uh, elite group. They are advocating uh, all kind of uh, anti-democratic practice. And then there are growing number of population become very tolerant or even welcome or even encourage uh, those, uh, those articulation and those practice. Uh, so that's in the case of Hungary. That's also in the case of Turkey. Uh, obviously, they, no, they are uh, getting popular support for their anti-democratic uh, practice and behavior. So that's really worrisome. So, uh, well, I, I agree with Karen, Karen that, you know, if you use different historical benchmarks, then you, you, you don't have to be so uh, alarmist, you know, say, yeah, you know, the war is better off, right, as compared to 1960, 70, 80, you know, we have more country become democratic. Um, but I would say, historian might also say, uh, wait a minute, you know, the, um, we might also bring back, you know, the, the hard lesson we learned during the 1920s and 30s. What happened to a lot of Western democracy uh, uh, during that two decades? Uh, and we, you know, are we, uh, you know, currently in, in a very similar kind of uh, dire situation? You know, for, for gives you just one example that, um, you know, across Europe, especially uh, Southern Europe, uh, and including countries like France, you know, the, the young generation, the unemployment rate is so high, and for so long, uh, you know, a lot, substantial number of young generation, they don't have a real job, you know, a sub meaningful job, much less a career. So this is a fertile breeding ground for extremists. Uh, and uh, I have to say, we are only see the beginning of this, this you know, this new, uh, you know, the process of deconsolidation. Uh, I'm, maybe I'm too pessimistic, but, but, but I have to say, uh, you know, we shouldn't be too complacent as well. Okay. You mentioned the middle class, and you mentioned that the system provides for people at the bottom, but does little for the to yeah. get people to get into jobs. We have a presidential candidate now in the U.S., which I suspect no one in this room has heard of, and you probably don't need to, but it's an interesting uh, Andrew Yang who's running on a platform of give every American 
of every age $2,000 a month. Um, because technology is changing the world and we've got to, in a sense, redistribute the wealth. I find that the height of technological arrogance, that we people in the tech world are changing the world and we're gonna dribble money on you. I mean, the whole point is to make the system work so that you can live the American dream or the Korean dream of if I'm willing to work, I can get a job and I can rise, not let the tech dollars trickle down on the underclass. And I'm just deeply offended by the guy's position. I don't know that anyone else is, but I think there is this, it's part of, again, why Trump got elected, that there is this sense that there is a class of people that think they are running the world and the rest of us are just here to it's, it's a lot salute. Of, a lot of tech people support this idea. Some of the very rich Silicon Valley, in Silicon yeah, Valley yeah, 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 yeah. actually support this. I want to link this to yeah. Korea uh, because um, so much of our overall discussion is Korea's choice. <clears throat> so President Moon Jae-in uh, came in with a very strong social platform and maybe some of the questions here will We'll, we'll draw on that and some of your comments from the audience, which we'll turn to next. But the idea is that he has come with a sense that this society was not fair. And he won on that theme more than on the North Korea issue. Uh, and he, he has been trying to deliver, but apparently it's not going very well, and how to create a more f a fairer society. A lot of young people are discontent in this country, I understand because of the job prospects that are pretty weak. It may be not so much total unemployment, but just underemployment and failure of the Korean dream as a factor here. Let's turn now to your questions, and we'll draw on the audience for the, their responses. Yes, Pam. Yeah. Um, thank you. It's uh, been an excellent uh, panel. Um, I've been very struck until Gil Rosman just raised the issue of Korean democracy, that the panel necessarily was looking at democracy in the large. Uh, but in East Asia, we have the emergence of uh, democracies in both South Korea and in Taiwan. Uh, singular accomplishments, if you think about it, that's the good news. The bad news, however, is even though you now have a context in which you have the alternation in power, uh, as a function of democratic elections in both societies, but it has not, so far as I can tell, in any way narrowed the profound ideological divides, uh, identity divides, if you will, that exist in both societies. So in this sense, it kind of makes democracy a bit incomplete. Uh, I'm wondering whether Yun Han in particular might have something to say. And if I could add to this just a thought experiment and if there were a way to do this technically, I think it would be a great idea. With the emergence of social media, if for sake of argument, there were a way that anyone posting on social media, and I must say, I avoid social media like the plague. I'm not on Facebook, I don't tweet, I don't do any of these things, but then I'm kind of old fashioned. But if you had to identify who you were, it would presumably diminish profoundly some of the incredibly hostile, ugly stuff that mm. appears every day. Now, maybe it can't be done technically, but just wondering out loud, would the role of social media look different if you had to identify yourself? Uh, Jonathan, I think that your question about Taiwan and South Korea and the gaps remaining extremely wide, we see that in this country and so many of the polls, the Asan poll information sitting out there on the table uh, about responses on various issues show enormous divides. That, how does that affect the legitimacy of democratic systems? And do you get national identity themes that begin to trump democracy as the driving way of thinking about issues? Uh, do we have another question? Yes, in the front there. Um, yes, thank you. I'll, I'll focus on the economic issue, which has been uh, pervasively uh, used. Uh, somehow, we didn't take democracy. Didn't take the, the lessons from the from the 
big crisis of 10, 10 years ago, uh, which confirmed that uh, pure total deregulation is incompatible with democracy, which requires balance of powers. And uh, uh, I wrote in, 27, uh, in 2007 that uh, it was, this was not a financial crisis, but a crisis of finance. It's not an economic crisis, it's a crisis of economics. And somehow it was the negation of economy, the negation of finance which led to, to this crisis. And so the solution is uh, to defeat uh, populism, which is once the use, particularly to, to be dis discouraged about politics and economy. To, no, to the contrary, you must have more polit politics and more economics, but the true uh, and transparency, which allows to expose uh, the impostures, just like Macron won uh, the debate by exposing the impostures of uh, populism and nationalism. So uh, accountability and justice are, are key. And uh, also to, to go back to, to, to Korea, uh, yes, there was a fantastic moment when uh, the debate was precisely about the fundamentals of democracy, the fundamentals of economy and justice. And there was this uh, formidable hope and then this disappointment. So it's, uh, democracy is very demanding, but then uh, you have to sustain this effort and, and deliver, and transparency is essential uh, for the gov governance, I guess. Thank you. Question back there. Um, thank you for your um, inspiring points of view. My name is Asme Song, I'm from China, and now studying international studies in Yuhua Women's University. Um, as uh, Mr. Chu has mentioned, social media has become a problematic factor in many um, democracies for introducing populism and um, uh, fake facts sometimes. However, in China, despite the ongoing censorship, uh, I think social media is playing an um, is playing a significant role, encouraging free thinking and uh, um, open discussions. Many people see social media as a trigger of the opening up of, of uh, Chinese civil society. Um, my question is, well, we are talking about um, democracy in crisis here. Do you think there's a possibility of a, a more liberal, liberalized China in the future? And uh, what would be the possible impacts on other democracies in the world? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's turn now to our panelists and um, get responses to any of the points you want. Um, any, go ahead. I can just the word with um, social media and the danger that has have been uh, raised, but uh, I agree with you that uh, in close society, social media is still an important um, uh, provide an important platform. Uh, for Iran, I have an uh, it's an amazing um, experience that for the first time, a movement was started on social media in a virtual platform which was women sending videos of unveiling uh, without veil. Uh, and this movement that was a virtual movement was then extended into the real space in the streets of Iran, where women take off their veils and confront um, uh, virtue police or militias. In, in Iran? In Iran. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as much as it can have a negative impact on democracy, it also is a platform that somehow forever um, has destroyed the monopoly of narrative by totalitarian system. So it has its good and its bad. It, can, it depends how you use it. Are you sure about that? I mean, back to the point that uh, uh, Dr. Pollock made, I think if people had to put their names on things, it would be different, but I mean, I spend a lot of time in Saudi Arabia, but I suspect China is the same from what I read. You can't, what's, n no Saudi really is on social media anymore. It is too dangerous to your health. People, the, the, who it is that's tweeting and who it is that's commenting when the government is following everyone, uh, most real people don't do it, so a lot of the comment is by religious <coughs> leaders or you know government officials or 
people like that. Now, maybe that's not true in China, but... Yes, because um, the society is much bigger, and people are under false names, but they are real, and the videos that are sent to Facebook or Twitter are real videos by women who used in, you know, in a closed place, take off their veil, just, uh, just showing their, uh, you know, they are against the mandatory veil, but after a while, this movement has been transported into the real space. And I think this is the first time where we see uh, the birth of a social movement in a virtual world then transported to the real streets of Iran, uh, which is actually an, a very Im interesting experiment to, to follow and to see where it leads. So I think it has good and bad. I mean, we can communicate with Iran only through Twitter and Facebook. And there is a debate. Uh, so people, people in Iran aren't afraid of being arrested well, they, for what they... Well, they take risk, but many of them are under false, and they, it's not, um, you know, it, they go through VPN or whatever, uh, because everything is filtered. Twitter is filtered, Facebook is filtered, mm. but the supreme leader himself <coughs> uses filtered uh, Twitter. So, it, you know, it has its good thing when you are faced uh, with a totalitarian system. Uh, Martin, did you have anything you wanted to add to any of this? I just think um, if you think about Korea, Taiwan, Japan, I mean, I am kind of struck by how East Asia is in a different moment, I think, than, than the U.S. Um, you, you know, we, we uh, talked about uh, kind of the polarization in Korea, but I don't think that's a, a new thing. I don't think that's even really a crisis in Korean democracy. In fact, I think it's probably testimony to the fact that Korea, South Korea, and Taiwan have achieved so much uh, that this is even possible. I, I think in Japan as well uh, that the, the discontents I mentioned, the disempowerment hasn't risen to a threshold level where it's really disrupted the system or changed the system. Um, you know, a lot of ways, I think what I was trying to say was that in Japan, this. Uh, the, cri the various crises seem to be fire on a distant shore, and they're waiting to see how these things play out, especially in the U.S. Uh, where it does hit home in Japan, I think, is a sense that Japan's century-long kind of dominance in Asia as the number one Asian power is over, that China passed it at some point, and so that has created, I think, some unease. Um, but at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. Abe is not the sort of disruptive outsider that, that, that Trump was. And I, I, I don't get the sense that this sort of angry populism uh, that we've been talking about really has had, that's not really what's driving Korean politics or, or Taiwanese politics, as far as I can tell. Um, so I, I do get a sense that if we're going to try to bring the discussion back to Korea, that, um, you know, that really the, the, the moment here is very, is very different. Um, and, and that, um, you know, if anything, that, that, that the prime beneficiaries of the post-war order have been Japan, Korea, Taiwan, countries like this. Um, you know, Karen does raise an inter interesting point about China. You know, does economic su success uh, require um, a free people, right? I mean, can you, chi China is a challenge in the sense of and, and we don't know if it's going to work or not, and perhaps it will not work out. But can a, a non-free society become an innovator? Can it become a, a leading force in, in IT? Uh, I mean, we see almost this sort of, with the Huawei uh, conflict in particular, kind of a, a Chinese IT world and an American IT world kind of almost clashing. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at Tencent and Alibaba, you know, they have some interesting innovations, but at the same time, they're essentially knockoffs of Facebook and, and kind of things that were invented in the U.S. Um, so I do think, like, to bring it back to Korea, it's, it's, I think it's more about, it does kind of tend to be expressed here, and I think in Japan as well, is more about, you know, the U.S.-led post-war order. And that post-war has remained intact in Asia, East Asia, in a way that it really hasn't elsewhere. I mean, North and South Korea, there's, there's the Cold War right there. Um, and so, uh, 
you know, does, so I think in there it's almost a sense of like, where is the global structure going that made East Asia's success possible um, more than, uh, I think, at this point, an internal sort of soul searching about democracy. It's, it's almost like the, uh, you know, how does Japan respond to a shifting balance of power and uh, a U.S. Uh, hegemon, which suddenly appears a lot less uh, sure about the role it wants to play in the world, or a lot more conflicted about that role. So I think to, to bring it to Korea, I think, is actually a very different discussion than if we're talking about mm -hmm. what's been happening in Europe and the U.S. I think it's, uh, um, you know, in, in the case of Korea, they're still trying to figure out how to do democracy, but I don't think it's some sort of, some yeah. sort of existential crisis of democracy. A, a big issue, um, I'll come to you in a I'm moment, Philip. So. A <laughs> big issue in this um, view of the U.S., which you regard as so important for a sense of, uh, is democracy working broadly, uh, is the perception of, of Donald Trump. And in Korea, you see a remarkable shift, and according to the Asan polls, after Donald Trump meets with Kim, Kim Jong-un. So, yes, he's doing the right thing by that meeting, and progressives much more than conservatives are saying that. And so his image managed to improve quite a bit. In Japan, it's Abe who's tried to create this image of very positive Trump-Abe relationship. So that has limited maybe some of the fallout against uh, the U.S., but that could be very fragile because in both countries, they're very nervous about what might happen next. Philip? Um, I'd like to just respond to two things. One, the question about China and, you know, is China be to be become more democratic? And I don't think any of us know, but if you look at the bargain at the moment, it's basically you can have economic freedom if you accept political repression. Uh, that's the deal, and it's been working. I personally would find it difficult to see that as sustainable in a 20, 30 year period. I mean, it was always, it was always said of the Soviet Union that it was unsustainable, but it was probably gonna be there forever. Uh, and it's there until it's not there. I just find a, a system of economic freedom and political repression one that's mm -hmm. not inherently stable. And then I just want to push back about one of my panelists on, uh, fellow panelists on Europe, because the Europe that you, you paint is the one I live in, and it's not the one I see at all. I mean, I travel to Hungary frequently. Hungary, you've got to understand, is a country of about seven million people. This represents a tidy part of Europe. It has a particularly nasty regime. Uh, the regime is there not because the Hungarian people don't like democracy. It's partly there because a lot of the hung young Hungarians have left. They're living in my country or living in France and whatever. So the demography of Hungary is tilted towards the sort of elderly agrarian. <laughs> and also for historical reasons, because the parties of the left were links with communism and corruption have been splintered and that's so you know don't judge Europe on Hungary abhorrent uh, though Hungary is and elsewhere you you know if you spend time in France or Italy or these other chaotic places where there are populist movements this is not about democracy this is about we don't like the political <laughs> establishment and they have real grievances you know the Italian political system a sort of stitched up power, you know, since the war, basically. And so this isn't about democracy, it's about political establishments and political elites. Uh, just to the question about should democracy uh, uh, get rid of divisions, I'd say no, it shouldn't at all. I mean, the whole point, I think one of the problems we've had in democracy is this concentration in the middle. Uh, democracy has to give people choices. Now, obviously, identity politics is slightly different, but healthy democracies, I think, have real choices between right, left, center parties. Well, thank you, and thank all of the panelists. I thought we had a stimulating discussion, and uh, please join me in uh, thanking our panelists. Thank you. <laughs>